Thank you, Aaron. I'm really pleased to see all of you here today. I'm looking forward to talking and especially looking forward to hearing your views, experiences and expertise on some of the questions that we're going to discuss shortly. But to begin, I'm just going to try and give a, a 10 minute um, tour um, to give you a taste of, of what I experienced as I went around the world in search of the future of education. Um, I'm going to show a couple of slides as I go. So I hope my share screen works. If it doesn't, that's okay. We can just talk. Great. So, yeah, I'm going to tell a quick story about the future of learning. And it begins for me uh, 10 years ago in a classroom just off the Old Kent Road um, on my first day as a secondary school English teacher. Um, and as I, when we started out, um, me and the kids, we, we struggled a bit. I was a, at the time a fresh faced university graduate who'd been to a lovely primary school in the countryside um, and who thought that teaching was just a question of standing at the front of the classroom and talking about ideas like I'd seen Robin Williams do in Dead Poets Society. Um, but I soon realized that it wasn't the movies. All of my kids came from these two big housing estates in South London called the Haygate and the Aylesbury that have since been knocked down. Um, about half of them were on free school meals, which was a, a measure of disadvantage in the UK. Um, two thirds spoke English as a second language. And all of them arrived at secondary school aged 11, a long way behind where they should have been uh, in their reading and writing. And this was through no fault of their own. The kids were very smart and they were witty. And they just weren't doing well academically. They hadn't had a good um, start in life. Um, and at the same time, I was aware that the world was changing fast around us. Um, the kids were using smartphones and they were you know, living in the future, plugged into their devices all the time. And the methods that I was using might have been familiar to Socrates. Um, now, whilst feeling that pain, I also um, had this sense that um, we could do better. Um, I was looking at the advances we were making in things like um, our understanding of the mind of neuroscience and psychology and of early child development. And I was looking at all the new inventions that we were making, our AI and our virtual reality and the uh, you know, powers of being connected globally in the world and thinking that if we could harness some of those uh, insights and some of that technology, we might be able to transform the way that we learn um, for the 21st century. On top of that, I was very aware that although I was preparing these kids to get their C grades at GCSE to be good readers and writers and to speak well, that by the time they would reach the age of 30, a lot of the jobs they were planning on doing um, were likely to be automated by machines, that well-being amongst young people was at an all-time low, that creative subjects were falling in the UK system. And so I had these two questions um, that I asked myself, how much are kids capable of learning? And what are we capable of? And secondly, what should kids be learning today? And those were the two questions that launched me onto this journey um, around the world and into the future of learning. And it took in meetings with trailblazing teachers on six continents, visits to high performing institutions and people doing new things, conversations with experts in um, neuroscience, experts in technology. And it left me sure that sort of in this age of accelerations, as Andreas Schweiker put it in that review, that the future doesn't rest on some new invention, but rather on how we develop people. And so just for a bit of framing, today, as we quite well know, human intelligence is, is under threat. So in 1997, when Guy Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue at chess, it was a sort of sign that our technology was now becoming more powerful than our human minds. People predicted a singularity when we'd be able to merge our minds with hyper-intelligent machines um, and sort of exceed our biological limitations. Um, but I wasn't so sure that we should be giving up on our human brains uh, just yet. And so for the first half of my journey, I decided to explore how much kids are capable of learning. And so went to South Korea. Um, so on a warm Thursday morning uh, in November, I stood outside this uh, concrete school hall in a place called Songdo Future City on the outskirts of Seoul. 
as across the country, hundreds of thousands of Korean teenagers were sitting down to the eight grueling hours of the Sunyung, which is an exam that takes place on a single day each year um, across Korea and is considered one of the world's toughest exams. So you get given a national rank afterwards and that decides your life, what university you'll go to, what kind of job you're able to do. Um, and the country really was exam crazy. Um, that morning, as I had journeyed to the exam hall, I saw police on motorcycles lining the streets ready to escort um, the, any late coming kids to the exam hall in case they missed the start. Um, the newspapers in the days running up to it had run um, editorials on what kids should wear for sort of optimum temperature, what um, food they should eat beforehand and during the exam, even sort of what offerings you should leave at the temple in order to bring good luck. Um, and I was there to hear the story of this boy called Seung Bin Lee, who at that time was sort of sitting inside the exam hall, his hands shaking, about to get started on his exams. Um, he explained to me that in Korean education, what you were really trying to do was to achieve these marginal gains. So in the exam, he said, it was better not to think, actually. You had to become a sort of instrument of pure exam-taking technique and to enter the zone and not to think and just to you know, pass all these questions. Um, it even happened that during the 45 minutes of the listening exam later on, they grounded all planes in the country so as not to affect the concentration of the kids during that part of the test. Um, so success was in these details. And although it was incredibly extreme to see, on certain levels, Korean education really works. It's an education miracle. Um, you know, 50 or 60 years ago after the Korean War, um, four in five Koreans were illiterate. It was an agrarian economy. They relied on handouts from foreign powers to make the country function. Today, the GDP of the country has grown 40,000%. Um, it's home to high-tech companies like Hyundai, Samsung, um, in the PISA test that we all know really well, where the 15 year olds across the world are tested, Korea regularly um, comes out on top. So I learned something there about the, the power of our minds, but I spoke to an education minister, in fact, called uh, Ju Ho Lee, who told me that um, Koreans don't have any resources, just their minds and hard work. And this was a, a triumph of hard work and a tri triumph of using mind power, but it was also exacting a really heavy toll um, on the well-being of Korean kids. Um, as I toured around the country, um, I heard about how kids revise. Soon Bin showed me his revision calendar, in fact. Um, in the three years leading up to this Soon Young, he had worked 14 hours a day, five days a week to revise for the exam, and a relatively restrained 12 hours a day on both Saturday and Sunday. And he told me that um, to relax once a month, he would allow himself to watch a DVD. Um, Korea has the highest teen suicide rate in the world. Korean childhoods, I think, are, are being taken away. When you talk to Korean adults, many of the people I interviewed who are now successful entrepreneurs talked, um, they, they cried um, reflecting on their school days because the experience had been so brutal. Um, and when I asked Sung Bin what he had done to beat this stress, um, he simply told me, I know it sounds strange, but I just work even harder. Um, so Korea taught me something about, yes, the power of education, but also like the detrimental effects certain approaches might have on our well-being, the importance of knowledge, but also the importance of there being space for kids to do other things. From there, I um, journeyed on to Silicon Valley, um, the sort of point zero of this tech tsunami that was sweeping across the world. I was convinced having been to Korea that each of our brains was capable of more than we were currently realizing. And I thought that I'd heard that computers might play some key role in augmenting our intelligence and, and transforming education. So at a place called Rocket Ship Schools in San Jose, I encountered um, my first robot teachers, um, but they weren't androids with human faces, rather they were intelligent pieces of software inside um, online learning environments. So Rocket Ship Schools has something called the Learning Lab. Um, and I went there with the head teacher of Rocket Ship, Ms. Guerrero, after she had led the whole school of 200 kids in a sing-along to Shake It Off by Taylor Swift, which she called Morning Coffee for the Kids. 
um, and they were certainly pumped. In this cavernous um, room, I saw 120 five-year-olds sitting in long rows, wearing headphones and purple polo shirts, each working away on laptops. And this room was sort of eerily silent, considering it was filled with 120 kids. All you could hear was the soft hand, the soft sound of sort of small fingers tapping on keys. Um, each of the kids was using either a program called ST Maths or Lexile. And as they were using that program to do their sums or to do their grammar exercises, the software was intelligently understanding their strengths and weaknesses and adapting the learning experience to the kids. The only adults in the room were a pair of untrained supervisors. There were no qualified teachers in there. Um, kids would, the, the teachers would drop their kids off here for between 60 and 90 minutes every day. And although it was quite eerie, um, it was sort of working. Rocketeers, which is what they call the kids there, outperform kids from similar backgrounds um, in California. They, they come top of the charts for disadvantaged kids in reading and writing and maths. Um, at the same time, I wondered if this was really the right way for them to be learning to use technology. It seemed that the computers were teaching them things that the computers themselves could already do a lot better than the kids. And this same thought had occurred to um, Gary Kasparov after he was defeated by uh, Deep Blue, um, the computer. And he wondered if chess could somehow be rescued from the dominance of the machines. Was there a future for human chess players? Um, and he invented something called advanced chess. Now in these games, any combination of teams of humans and computers can play against each other. And what's quite hopeful is that over time, humans began to develop anti-computer styles in chess and defeat these new machines. And then even better, human computer teams became very good. So the winners of these chess, these cyborg chess tournaments today aren't the most powerful computers or the greatest grandmasters. Instead, they're people that have learned to coach machines uh, into looking deep into chess positions. Um, so the winners are those who have learned to use new technologies in creative ways. Um, so down the coast from rocket ship, I saw a school that was beginning to teach kids to use technology in this fashion. Um, it's a place called High Tech High that I'm sure some of you may have heard of. And there, on top of having about half the kids' time spent doing you know, basics like English, maths, and science, the other half of their time is in these big cross-disciplinary projects. Um, so this one class here, which you can see, which I went into, felt like a futuristic sort of design lab. Um, there were three different groups of kids in this one class, they're about 15 years old. One group was experimenting with um, creating biodegradable seed pods. Um, another group was planning and scripting a documentary. And still a third group was building drones completely from scratch. Um, and the class was going to end with a five-day excursion into the California wilderness, where they were going to fly cameras over the national park, make a study of the degradation of plant species, replenish the ones that were missing with the seed pods, and then film a documentary of this whole thing, which was then going to go up on YouTube to tell the story um, of climate change and environmental degradation in California. So although it seems like machines can threaten us, if we learn to use them um, in creative ways, I think they can help make us smarter. So finally, um, I wanted to know how we might use this knowledge about how the mind works and the technologies that we have to create a, a happier, better, more, more creative world. So I went to Finland and paid a visit to the classroom of the country's most famous teacher, this guy called Pekka Peora. Um, and so at the start of his classroom, uh, Pekka Peora flashed up a question on the interactive whiteboard. Then he got students to use their mobile phones to beam in answers, which he displayed on a bar chart, sort of A, B, C, D, and E. Then he didn't tell them the answer after that, but instead asked them to talk to each other. What answer had they given? Why had they given that answer? Um, he then asked them to beam their responses in again, A, B, C, D, and E. And the bar, bar chart had shifted dramatically. The kids had taught each other, essentially. And Pekka Peora told me afterwards that he thought his most important job wasn't to help kids get to the answers, but instead to give them the skills and attitudes they needed to learn things for themselves. 
It even studied how uh, Google makes its most successful teams and was using the principles um, from what he had learned to create um, uh, the environment in his classroom. So it was a sort of classic flipped learning classroom where he would give all of the materials the students needed to them at the beginning of the year, the curriculum, the textbooks, the tests, the answers to the tests. And then instead he would coach them on their ability to learn individually and together, giving them feedback on things like perseverance and creativity and imagination and teamwork. And that's what they tracked in trackers, how, they, how well they were doing on each of those things. At the end of the year, he took this to a real extreme. He even got the students to choose their own state mandated grades, which he would enter into the system. Um, when I asked him um, what he did if kids fell behind in this approach, I was very concerned about that at the time. He just looked at me strangely and asked, what is behind? Um, he thought that everybody was different and what was important was where you were heading next. He thought learning was all about allowing everybody to fail continually in small ways. That would be how they would make progress. And, you know, I think Finn's as I'm sure you well know, love education. Um, famously, the country has 10 applicants for every one place on its primary teacher training programs. Um, that course includes learning how to play the piano and learning how to ice skate, which I think is very cool. It's one of the most prestigious jobs you can do in the country. Um, Finland, by many measures, also makes more of its people than any other country in the world. So it comes top of the World Economic Forum's Human Capital Index, if you care about economics, comes top of the UN's Happiness Index, if you care about happiness. It's also a hotbed of creativity. So home to companies like Angry Birds or Nokia. Um, it's home to strange um, and creative sports like hobby horsing, which was invented by Finnish teenagers, a sort of, sort of imaginary show jumping. And it also has more heavy metal bands per capita than any other country in the world. And excitingly, Pekka, Peora was in one of them. And so as I encountered these stories around the world, um, I thought a lot about my time back in the classroom in South London. Um, we had succeeded, I succeeded as a teacher in the end with my kids, at least on what I had set out to do. All of the class got their C grades or above that they needed to pass the exams at 16. 16. But the way that we had got there with these long hours of exam practice, these extra English classes, after this journey left me feeling like I had failed those kids. Um, so there are some great stories. Tammy is now a nurse. Um, Benga, who is in my class, is taking photographs part time. But at the same time, Amanda is unemployed. Um, another student of mine, Emmanuel, is in prison. And I know now that all of them were and all of them are capable um, of a lot more. Um, across the world today, uh, that's true for all kids. The World Bank says that 600 million kids in the world today are not on track to master even the basics they need to succeed in today's world, let alone take on the big challenges of the future like global inequality or automation of jobs um, or climate change. Um, so our schools, as they currently stand, aren't giving kids, I think, what they need to succeed and thrive in today's world. But I really believe that they could do that. Um, if kids could learn as much as they do in somewhere like South Korea, or if they could develop their faculties of um, creativity and creative use of technology, like they're doing somewhere like High Tech High, or if they could learn to co cooperate and to care and to be empathetic like kids do, in Finland, then I think that we could transform human learning. I think that potentially we stand on the, on the cusp of a, of, a, of a revolution in human learning. And I think we'll build it around certain principles of learning to think, learning to really use the full faculties um, of our minds, understanding that that requires developing knowledge and then building on that knowledge to develop critical thinking. I think it also means learning to do more than we do today. So learning to create and um, learning to use um, all parts of our bodies as well to exist in the world. It means investing more in arts education and those kinds of subjects. And also to be, 
Um, I think we have this global crisis of well-being amongst young people, but there are some fantastic, fantastic institutions around the world that are helping kids to develop faculties of belonging or mindfulness, learning to look after themselves, um, look after their own health and mental health. Like those are the three things, but on top of those, I would add two more. Um, like the first is cooperation. I think kids today need to learn to work together. I mean, not just kids, everybody does, but I think within schools, what opportunities can we create for, help, for helping kids to learn to work and be together? And finally, to learn to learn. This feels like the most important outcome that you can have in an education, is that you're equipped with the joy of learning, the passion in what you're studying, um, and then the the sort of basic skills that you need to learn things for yourself, to tackle the problems that you see um, in your own life, in your community, um, or even in the world. Um, so I came back from my journey around the world, hopeful that we might achieve th these things. And that knowing that sort of if we're to learn to thrive um, as a species, as um, people across the world, in the 21st century, in this digital future that we have, then we need to turn our attention away from our devices and our technologies and our school system structures, and instead invest everything in the most important human work of developing people. Um, and I just want to finish with a little quote from uh, Aaron Sorkin of the West Wing, uh, who says that, of course, with all of these challenges we face worldwide, it's education uh, that is the silver bullet. Thanks so much, Alex, for that truly exhilarating and, and panoramic overview of some of the best practices around the world. I think particularly thinking about why, why KER came into existence um, and some of the challenges that we face in India, giving the few hundred million kids in this country the tools and skills that they, they need to learn on themselves seems like a truly wonderful prospect. And I think at, at the same time, there's a, there's a really imminent need to shift the purpose of education away from exams and make it much more about holistic development and all students' potential, much like um, Pekka Payora, the, the Finnish teacher, spoke about. So I'm going to attempt a, a second screen share just to give all of you um, an overview of KER um, through preview this time and not PowerPoint. Um, could you, could you, if your video is on, could you just give me a thumbs up if you can see the, the screen this time? Yeah. I'm going to take that as a yes. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. So when, when KER came into existence about um, a year and a half ago, the founding belief was that across schools and organizations in India, from private schools um, with, with high-income students to schools with kids coming from low-income and low-resource backgrounds, there are too many students who weren't learning in a way that actually had any relevance and meaning to their lives. There was a, a real lack of student agency, voice, and potential. And this collective of schools and organizations came together around a belief of shifting the purpose of education by actually reimagining education with our students. For too long, the idea has been adults actually doing it for our children. And here, much like um, Peke Payora, we were actually trying to think about doing it with our students. Secondly, as, as Alex spoke about, with so many of the pressing issues of this century, the, the ideas of AI and automation, 
our students now more than ever need to be learning skills to be innovators and entrepreneurs. They need to have the social and emotional skills in order to take on the unique challenges of this century. And finally, our system, particularly in India, is marked by one where many people want the same thing, but end up reinventing the wheel in silos. What we need much more of is a, is a new kind of radical collaboration where different schools and organizations can come together to scale and spread their areas of mastery and best practices. So it was with these ideas last year, around this time that we set out on our first journey of, of building the kids' education revolution. And after sparking the idea of student-led change around the country, what we did was we hosted seven regional summits in Teach for India cities to basically give students a chance to showcase the contributions that they're making towards a better world. We had students on the one hand who built their own 3D printers and were talking to educators about their passion for technology. We had kids on the other hand, as you see over here, who facilitated design thinking for educators. Um, they showcased the contributions that they were making in their classrooms, in their schools, and in their communities. And this was a product of many years of belief in student leadership, particularly in Teach for India cities, um, which culminated in a week when we brought together 101 students from around the country to basically lead India's first student-led educational conference. So the, the week was divided into a retreat where the kids had a chance to connect with each other at very deep levels and share their own unique journeys and also build some of the 21st century skills. In the second part, the students launched their revolution to a wide audience of about 800 people, focusing around the idea of student voice in education. And finally, they hosted a, a marquee summit. And over the course of the week, it was really amazing to see these strong and confident individuals begin to actually see each other as a community. And this came through in how they, commu how they communicated and brainstormed with each other, how they supported each other, and in the bonds that they formed and sustained in the weeks and months after the national summit. What was also beautiful to see was just the power of collaboration across a wide range of schools and organizations. So Jagyasa is actually with us on, on this Zoom call. And in this, in this photo, you see students from her organization, Slam Out Loud, which builds expression in the arts based out of Delhi, conducting a, a really deep and powerful experience for educators focusing on the value of expression. And similarly, we had Riverside students from Ahmedabad showcase their unique interpretation of design thinking, feel, imagine, do, share. We had students from the first grade at BD Somani, a private school in Bombay, who took educators through an experience of block building to see what the social sciences could look like in a reimagined way. And through all of this, what really stood out was the power of collaboration in a diverse collective. A range of educators across different schools and organizations coming together to share their ideas and learning from students. In, in many ways, I think what we also saw, the photograph in the background here, is that of students actually leading the conversation about a reimagined education. So what you see over here is Mahesh, one of our KER revolutionaries, speaking to Anil Swaroop, who's the erstwhile principal secretary of education in Maharashtra, talking about the need for changes in the system. And what we started wondering about is, how can we amplify these ideas to the wider ecosystem to get more people involved and invested in the idea of reimagining education? And a final question that lingered with us, given that it had been a year that went past at a breakneck pace, looking at students like Osman, Insha, Safa, and Tuba over here, who'd campaigned for their community to ditch plastic and begin to recycle, what we were thinking about is how, can the, how is the idea of student leadership fostered? And what role can kids play, kids play in actually spreading these ideas and making a dent in the wider system? And, in, and what emerged through the process was five strategic priorities, which I'm, I'm gonna paste in the chat window, which are anchoring our work for this next year. So the first is that of building a stronger and more sustainable collective of schools and organizations who build radical collaboration with each other to reimagine education. The second is to take these 101 revolutionaries we brought together for the last national summit and actually build a student movement which reimagines education, giving them the skills and tools that they need, the experiences to both learn and lead to make changes in the system. The third is that of much more intense work with our seven Teach for India cities to build learning labs where different ideas around student leadership are experimented with, learning loops through which we cull out practices that feed back into program and amplification of bright spots so that within each of those cities, more and more fellows and students can learn about these wonderful efforts. The fourth one is something that we've already touched upon, which is the idea of actually learning from 
these, these unique and brilliant kids. Deep diving into their projects, thinking about what their enablers have been, what the, what the community around them has, how the community around them has changed as, as a result of, of their work. And finally, that of amplifying these, these ideas and tools and practices to the wider ecosystem. So Alex, given, given your experience of spending so much time around the world, um, examining student movements, thinking about collective action, I know you've done some research on that before this book as well. Would love to just hear some of your broad thoughts and reflections on how you see KER shaping up for the next year. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, so I should just begin by saying um, how excited I am to have learned about this, and how excited I am by what you're doing. And as you share the examples of the things that have happened so far, um, how much confidence I have that they are the right starting points for, for this work. Um, so this idea of, of collective leadership, of creating spaces in which people happen, I think of the example of the Nordic countries, um, of Finland in particular, and how its education system improved. So there are lots of, you know, policy lessons that we can pay attention to and things they did with teachers. But there's a very interesting um, set of things that happened before that. Um, so, you know, Nordic countries weren't always high performing systems or sort of thriving societies. Mainly they were um, rural agrarian economies um, sort of in the 19th century, early 20th century. And then what happened was these social movements sprang up in the countries, national conversations about what the nation should be, what values they should have, what it should stand for. And they went through a process of creating spaces in which citizens would come together. So you had this national program where you could go and spend months living in sort of communally with others, not from your town, not from your um, economic sector, not from your, you know, people that you know. And you would live together, you would learn from others, learn who others were, what motivated them, and you got a sense of what society could be. And it was out of this movement of these kinds of um, in-person communal gatherings that a lot of the values of these Nordic countries became embedded from countries which were previously very authoritarian and warlike, it must be said. Um, and so this collective thing has um, um, a root in, in those stories of the Nordic nations and how they became um, great sort of education powers and how they became more equal societies. So that's something that's exciting. I think that we've also seen across the Teach for All network and in these travels, the power of the collective at the classroom level. I think the most exciting schools I've visited, like Pekka Peora School in Finland or like High Tech High, have an ethic at the classroom level where the students are in charge of what is happening, decide what learning is going to take place, and then don't work on that learning alone in the classroom, but rather work on it together. And it's often in those scenarios spilling out into the world beyond. So in both those settings, the kids are often working on real world um, projects that exist within the communities in which they live. So trying to solve problems um, that they see around them. So High Tech High has this wonderful thing they do at the beginning of um, kids experience in the school where the kids all do a seven day walk. Um, so it's in San Diego, uh, the school, and which is near the border with Mexico. So they begin at the Mexican border and they do this walk together, which is a bonding experience, but it's also to help them to look at and understand the community in which they're living and what they see to build connections with people outside of the school. So I think this collective ethic, this idea of building a movement um, is really exciting. Classically, when you think about how to change education systems, you think about policy, you think about implementing, you think about politics. Um, now, that's how we've always thought about changing things in education. And it hasn't always um, worked. You can have fantastic policies. You think you pull a lever, and everything changes, or you have an implementation unit that oversees that stuff and it gets things to be a bit better. And these things I think are important, but they don't get you the whole way. Um, the politics, I think that's where people become involved in education. That's where movements grow up. It's where everybody recognizes that as individuals, we're part of a system and we all have agency within that system. Um, but even more important than that, I think, is culture. Um, and that's where you're telling new stories um, about what education is for, who can be involved in education. You have new behaviors, 
where children are leading this work. You have new beliefs, ultimately, about what education is, what it's for, and who gets to decide those questions. And I really see evidence of all of those deep lessons in the strategy you've got there. So it's really focused on the culture that exists around education. It's all about new beliefs, new behaviours and new stories. And I think that that is really exciting. Thank you, Alex. Um, I think one of what, while, while you were speaking, while one of the things I was thinking about is the fact that in many ways, our education system is now increasingly beginning to reflect the inequalities of the world. There aren't enough chances for people from different backgrounds to actually come together. And I, and I love what you were alluding to in terms of the sense of a shared humanity, um, having powerful experiences that bring communities together um, and actually bind them. And, and what I'm wondering about is, particularly in a student movement, if we're to bring these 101 kids from around the country, very different backgrounds, some in private schools, learning in the IB curriculum, others in the state curriculum, what do you feel sustains movements like these? Yeah, I think the first thing that we have learned sustains movements are relationships. So building close, meaningful, authentic, one-to-one -one connections with people within the group. And so a movement begins, I think, in that way. And there are, there's lots of evidence for this. And there are also lots of ways of very purposefully creating spaces or giving people the tools to build one-to-one -one relationships. A big part of it is learning how to tell your story, but also how to listen to the stories of other people. So I wonder that what, we, what we can do to support kids in those settings to be able to build those kinds of meaningful relationships with others. I think also um, there is this question of um, creating spaces in which that is the primary purpose and not necessarily structuring everything overly and like getting kids to do things but just allowing those relationships to emerge more organically i mean i'm really interested to hear a bit more maybe from you or from shaheen about how you have thought about building that movement like first both like how you're approaching it what you think the key elements of doing that are but also why this approach of the movement is the right one for um, education in India today. Hey, hi all of you. Alex, thank you, Percy. It's just fascinating to be on this call and hear a little bit um, of so much rich learning from you. Um, I think, I mean, the, the most important thing to say is that we're at a very starting stage and so, KR at this stage is a huge exploration, a big experiment, and, and we have a lot more questions than answers right now. Um, but I think why, and I think just building on, on the, the many points Aaron already made, for me the most compelling reason is we have too many kids in India. Um, and when you think about that staggering number, 320 million kids, and you think about them as like a mass of kids who need an education, uh, that feels incredibly overwhelming. Uh, but when you flip that idea and you think about that as a massive resource um, and 320 partners in getting to educational equity, um, suddenly sort of everything shifts in the way you think about your actions. And so that's really the paradigm shift. And I like to try to visualize it in a, in a typical Indian classroom where you'll have 40, 50, 60 children, all at different levels, many grade levels behind. And one um, teacher comes in uh, and is charged with the education and the holistic development of all of those children. And that feels really overwhelming. But if you were to shift the paradigm to say, actually there are 40, 50, 60 learners and partners to that teacher in the classroom. Um, and each child has something to learn and something to contribute. And in contributing, they will learn. Um, 
what does that classroom sort of look like? And when you, when you sort of extrapolate that across a nation, that becomes a very, very powerful force. Um, so I think that's one reason. I think the second, being in India specifically, is um, we have a legacy um, of, of a very, very powerful social movement um, with our independence and with Gandhi. And, and what is very exciting about that is that it, it was intended to be um, a, a very bold movement that had at, as its core change through nonviolence and, and passive nonviolence. Um, and I think that's something we're thinking a lot about here. What would a movement that tries to um, equalize power a little bit? So today in India, and I, I would argue around the world, power is in the hands of the teacher within the education system, power is in the hands of the educator. What does it mean to start to shift that power so that there's more partnership between student and teacher or child and adult. Um, and if we can find a way to do that um, where kids don't approach the system with anger and advocacy, but approach it with love and, and a spirit of partnership of wanting to help, um, will they overwhelm adults such that power actually starts to shift in the system. I think that's, that's sort of the big idea within which we're trying to experiment and, and explore. Thanks, Shaheen. Um, I think so many powerful ideas there, but I, I think particularly the, the one of channeling the lessons of previous movements and, and having our kids live those lessons is one that, that is very exciting. Um, Alex would, would love to hear from, from many of you as well. So if, if you have questions, please feel free to, to join in the discussion now. Um, you can either type your, your question in the chat window or, or take yourself off mute and, and ask Alex. We'd love to hear from, from some of you as well. I would, I would yeah, just kind of building on the, the question of the power of student movements, I was really fortunate um, to visit Hong Kong um, as part of the research for the book and meet um, a young uh, student called Joshua Wong. And Joshua Wong at age um, 14 had seen that there, were, as a, there was an attempt by the national Chinese government to change the education curriculum in Hong Kong and introduce a new one that would have involved what he thought was gonna be brainwashing. And so he began to organize a protest against this new curriculum, going out to metro stations with his friends, handing out flyers against the new curriculum being introduced. And he built slowly over the course of months, a social movement of hundreds of thousands of Hong Kong teenagers and parents who eventually occupied the square outside the General Assembly within Hong Kong and managed in the end to defeat um, this, this curriculum change which really brought home to me in a way that I hadn't seen before at a macro scale, how powerful kids can be and how much agency they can have um, in changing the world around them. And then all the incredible classrooms, of course, that I visited where this was happening in countless communities and countless places around the world. Yeah, measuring holistic outcomes is a good question. Um, I have seen things, I think, that um, have helped me to understand how teachers or schools or students might assess how they're doing on a wider set of holistic outcomes. Um, so Pekka Pira's classroom, for example, was a really good one. He had created student self-assessment forms that used these um, emojis, actually, for kids to rate how... Um, secure they felt about pieces of content in the curriculum. So you could sort of be like big smiley face, I totally get this, and you would sort of tick that box on your Google sheet, or you could be like crying with laughter, there's no way I understand this thing, I'm totally lost. And then he used that, you know, sort of the, for the 30 points in the curriculum in his course, the kids would sort of mark themselves off, and then they would be encouraged to look at each other's, so that if you had, you know, a, a crying face on this bit, you could go and ask a kid with a smiley face how that was. Um, and then, the other piece that he had was a, 
a framework that he developed, which was listing out lots of characteristics that the kids um, had decided they wanted to develop in a particular term. So we want to get better at teamwork. We want to get better at um, being creative or coming up with ideas. And he had again created a rubric for them, which they could sort of track their own um, progress in that work. So it wasn't, you know, rigorous in that way that it might be, but it was giving the teachers and the kids all of the information they needed to know that they were making progress on some of those holistic outcomes. Um, and of course, there are, you know, things like the PISA test, which are now looking at a, a slightly broader range of things with collaborative problem solving. We can give it at, um, kids agency as well as uh, the classic basics. But, but I do feel like some of those tools are still um, in their infancy. Um, one of my favorite places that I went to was the MIT Media Lab, and they were trying to come up again with some way of measuring what they do there. So the MIT Media Lab is this crazy hotbed of creativity where everybody works in these strange teams. They're all um, university students, and they have scientists working with artists, working with dancers, working with writers, and they're allowed to come up with any projects that they want over the course of a couple of years. And the, they have had a big meeting recently about what are the criteria against which we're going to evaluate whether the stuff we're doing is working. And they managed to come up with three criteria. Um, does it work? Does it have a real world purpose? And is it magic? Um, and I think that some of these sort of creative ways of thinking about how you evaluate things like creativity can be useful. Um, high Tech High actually just gives kids a one or a zero on each of their projects. Um, either you did it and you participated, um, or you didn't do it and you didn't participate. Um, so I think it's in its infancy, um, that, type of, that type of measurement. And I don't think that we'll be able to measure everything that we care about personally in the end. I'm again interested, there are many people on this call with great expertise, so I'd love to yeah, hear other perspectives. I'm interested from the from the have, it, have the kids ed education revolution yeah began to begun to think about how to measure some of these outcomes as well and what are your initial ideas for, for how you might do that? <laughs> so I can tell you my dream that I'm just waiting for someone to execute um, and I, I I typed it a little bit out there but I'm just thinking of how much research there is now to show that like a student's evaluation of teacher performance is such a predictor of a strong teacher. And I'm imagining like a very simple app, very similar to what you described with smiley faces around simple questions, um, which kids are literally filling in after every lesson or every day. Um, and so that t a teacher has live feedback on was the class joyful? Did the kids learn what was actually taught? But some simple way to integrate student voice and feedback regularly into the very fabric of a lesson. And I'm extrapolating if you were able to roll that data up because it would all be technology based. Um, even at a city level, you would have information on 80% of your kids feeling scared in class or feeling like you know they were able to fail. I mean, it, it could be any criteria, but I think it's such a powerful idea to sort of explore. Yeah, I love that. There's a, a new app that's just been created by a group of teachers in the UK that are doing that for teachers. So every day they send a question out to a community of tens of thousands of teachers and ask them one question about how their school is set up, how they're feeling, their well-being. And it strikes me that you could very easily do that for students. That could be part of the movement as you can sign up, you can get a profile and you can get on the mailing list where you receive these questions um, every day. I really like that. Um, so I, I, I saw a product which is a little like this, um, at, uh, which was designed by students at Copenhagen Institute of Design. And it's essentially a band uh, that students wear um, that kind of has smileys or emojis which kind of shows their emotions and through the day uh, right from the time they get on to the school bus to the time um, when they come back home they after every half an hour 45 minutes the band kind of 
prompts them to choose the emotion that they're feeling and on which end they are on the spectrum. Um, and that kind of takes in data and data is sent to the school informing them um, in which classes are the children most happiest, excited. Um, also the data tells them, are they happy when they're on the bus? Are they excited to come to school? How are they feeling when they're going back to, from school? So I think that device kind of captures that data very effectively yeah, to, some, to some extent. Yeah, I visited another um, a sort of coding university in Paris called 42, and it's a university with no teachers, um, where all of the work that kids do is in peer groups, and there's this amazing software where they sort of walk through. So the academic content you do according to um, levels and sub-levels, and you just sort of make your way through this slightly gamified learning experience. But then the way that you get um, feedback or sort of assessment on your other more holistic set, set of outcomes is from your peers. So there's sort of like a regular peer feedback, peer review mechanism, where you can give feedback to other students on their strengths and how they're developing, which would be like another interesting thing to bring into this, although obviously to do it sort of carefully um, and sensitively and with love. Fascinating questions around the, the idea of either individual-led or peer-led learning. Alex, I'm, I'm noticing between Jagyasa and Payal's questions in the chat window, um, questions about the broader system in terms of actually contextualizing some of these assessments or perhaps finding a balance between curriculum and the needs of, of systems as they are. And would, would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, this is also, I, I can speak from the, from the UK experience here and it's something that's very real in UK schools. So I um, very much taught as a teacher the, the, the culture of the system is towards teaching to the exams. And the exams that kids take in the UK are still really important. And if they don't get good grades on those exams, then employers will look at them differently. They may you know, feel that they have failed if they haven't done well, they won't get into universities they maybe want to go to. It still is a hindrance. And at the same time, I know that those exams um, adversely influence our system. They really undermine our education system. Everything becomes narrowed to this very um, small point of mastering the basics in particular subjects, reading, writing, math, science, plus a couple of others. And the skills you need to develop to pass those exams don't equip you for um, later life. We have one in five adults in the UK is functionally illiterate, despite you know people seeming to do relatively well at school. So I think that this is a long game. The government isn't about to end those exams. So new schools that are springing up, I think, for example, of School 21, which is a school in our um, that's run by a Teach First ambassador that some of you may, may know. And they have built a school around a sort of project-based learning model um, with all sorts of incredible um, attributes. So kids there try to develop oracy, which is the ability to sort of speak and express themselves really well. Every year, every child does a TED talk um, to the whole of their year group. And that TED talk increases in length until age 16, you're doing a 15 minute talk standing up. Um, it's all about developing the agency of the kids. So they also do community projects. But at that school, they are still having to put their kids through GCSE exams and their school is still being judged um, by how that system sees them. So I think that at the moment, they have to operate in, with their feet in both worlds. Um, so they are half the time preparing kids for those sort of seminal exams and the other half of the time embracing the kind of education they want to give to children. Now, I think if you, can, if you can start soon enough and if kids can get on it soon enough, like all the things you need to do to pass those exams, I think become part of what is a really good holistic education. So in the top private schools where the kids are, you know, come with all of these advantages in the UK, yes, they take the exams, but actually they don't spend their whole time preparing for exams. They spend their time you know, reading and thinking about literature and you know, thinking, uh, making art and doing plays and things as well. Um, so there is this, this question of, of, of uh, what time pressures do, but I do think you can navigate within the structures of systems and do new things 
and kids can still succeed by those terms. What we should be aiming towards is revolutionizing those systems. I mean, KER or the work that kids are doing in different places is exciting because it creates the possibility that we'll begin to value different things and look differently at what it means to be successful. You know, plenty of employers now are no longer looking at how kids did in their degree or did at school before making decisions about um, whether those kids can work for them or not. You know, you don't need a bit of paper to show that you have like grown your um, your well-being or your sense of community. Like those things are not things you're going to be examined on, but they're so important for for how you live um, beyond beyond school. So I wonder, yeah, how can we? compartmentalize some of that stuff to give ourselves the freedom as teachers and, and school leaders to, to do the things that we really want to do. Um, and what sort of, does that require attitudinal changes of us? Do we really have to do all the things that we think we have to do? Are we able to get around some of them um, to create new possibilities? But yeah, it's a very, it's a very real question and a very difficult one. And, you know, just a, a word to occur, I think that's why this combination of approaches where you're sort of working with um, a movement of kids but also with system leaders to make arguments in different places to intervene in the system in different spots feels um, really smart Alex I'm thinking here about Mansi's question um, when, when she's talking about some of the very pressing needs of the current reality, um, I think Mansi, Mansi and, and many other educators who are on this call, particularly in India, have, um, say, the 10th grade board exam, which will be a, a marker for, for their students um, and determine a number of their possibilities in the immediate future. So how, how do you see um, educators in their own classrooms finding a balance between trying to revolutionize practice while also um, while also working for for the real needs of the system yeah this is hard so you know different places that i went to encounter this, this try to solve this in different ways so again thinking about um you know somewhere like shanghai the focus there is really on uh, creating a high performing education system in which it's all about helping every child to master each of the basics. And you go into a classroom in Shanghai and it is like a precision um, engineered machine. So it's like 35 minutes. Um, the lesson is in like these two or three minute chunks. They sort of ping pong around these different questions, have six or seven different ways of coming at the same um, concept to layer sort of understanding and help kids do it. There's loads of drilling and repetition and the kids there learn the content they need to really fast um, at the same time that system as is recognized by shanghai policymakers now has its has real limitations so i think what's good about it is you know research shows that if you want to be creative if you want to be a great critical thinker then first of all you do have to master the basics um, so you have to really know your stuff, really learn um, the kind of content, the foundations of your subject area, so that when you get to those higher levels of thinking and doing um, and being, you can automatically use the tools of that trade. And that's what this um, rote learning approach that they have um, in Shanghai classrooms really gets them to. It's like learning the basics really thoroughly and really repetitively, so that again, in the future, you're able to build on that basis and, and in theory, you know, think and create and so on. However, what they're not really doing in those places is creating the spaces to create, to actually do that kind of creativity. So I'd love to just say about, like, some of you may know the psychologist Benjamin Bloom and the work that he did to study what creativity is and how it grows. Um, and there are sort of two big parts to it. One part is that hard work thing that they do in Shanghai. So it's like endless hours of training and drilling and getting really good at your craft through repetition. And this is true whether you're a neuroscientist or an artist or a sports person, whatever you might be. Um, that's quite well known. We know about this 10,000 hours of practice leads you to become really good at what you do. What's less well known about the study that Benjamin Bloom did of these creative geniuses is that 
at the beginning of their careers in their chosen field, they had what he calls a romance stage, where they had an opportunity to play and like they fell in love with their particular pursuit. Um, they experimented with it and they inquired. Um, and so, and that requires space and time and opportunity to encounter different things and different things that you might really like to do. And so I think at the moment, what I see as a trend in school systems in many countries is all towards the practice, towards the mastery of the basics, towards drilling all of that work. And I think that that is really, really important. We can't get rid of that. I think we, we need to have some of it with some of these difficult things that we, that we have to learn to do as human beings. However, we have to hold this other space, this other, you know, high tech heights, half of the time is this other space. In some schools, it's more, in some it's less. Um, and I think sort of as kids get older, maybe you can play around with the proportions. But how do we hold spaces within our classrooms in which kids can explore and create and work together and communicate with one another while still doing that fast work of preparing them in the basics that they need to succeed? So I think it's, you know, can we be good at code switching at this point um, until such a time as we can create amazing early childhood institutions, you know, in every um, town, in every community, in every city, so that kids get this great support from day one. With the world as it is, I think we need to now as educators be good at doing both of those things, preparing kids really rigorously in the basics, but also creating spaces for exploration, connection, growth of empathy, and so on. And that is very difficult, of course. There, there's not an easy answer to that question. Would love to hear questions from, from a few more of you. Please feel free to either take yourself off mute and ask Alex or, or post questions in the comment window. Alex, I'm, I'm going to share one of the questions that um, one of the participants had shared while signing up, which is something that you've alluded to already. We would love to hear your broader thoughts and, and maybe a few more examples. What could the role of technology look like in the future of learning? Hmm. Yeah, I think this is a great question. Um, so when I set out to... Um, make this journey into the future of learning. It was inspired in part by hearing all of these great stories about how technology was going to revolutionize the way that we learn and what we learn. And ultimately, I think that some of the rhetoric that you hear about that might be over the top. That said, I think that technology can play an important role. And there are three things I think about um, attention, um, I think about access um, and I think about this idea of um, augmentation in, in, in the use of, in the use of uh, sorry, autom automation. And so, you know, technology, I think, can give access. Now, that is access first and foremost to kind of like, you know, a digital world in which you can see all of the information that is out there in a way that you um, couldn't before which is great. At the same time, it seems like um, that access to information, first of all, doesn't reach everybody. You still need to have devices, be online, and that's not true um, for anybody, uh, for everybody um, in the world or for everybody in any particular country. So there's still sort of uh, an access gap there. And then even when you do have access to this stuff, I think that the idea that then suddenly this will um, give us the opportunity like a sort of through a Khan Academy, for example, any kid can now learn um, maths worldwide. And of course, millions of kids do use the Khan Academy 
um, to learn maths, but also there are many hundreds of millions who clearly don't. And I think that we're seeing with some of these um, online um, learning platforms and with MOOCs, massive open online courses, that the rates of completion of these courses by people that sign up to them are very low, you know, 5% or 10% of people ever make it to the end of an online course. So this great um, opportunity of access doesn't seem to work on its own. However, where it does really seem to work is where there is a teacher or a peer group that is helping to broker access to that content in classrooms. So somewhere like um, King Solomon Academy, which I visited in London, they use Khan Academy in their math lessons. And I think so where you have a teacher mediating it, this kind of access to information really works. Um, this idea of, of, of attention, I think, is really important as well. So education, of course, depends on kids um, paying attention. Um, and technology is really good at harnessing um, our attention. Like we all know how addictive our sort of smartphone apps are. Um, we know like, how long you can spend sort of getting lost on things online. Um, and some people have sort of said, well, you know, in that case, could we therefore become uh, addicted to learning? Like, is there a way to create bits of tech that really get people um, to be addicted to it? Um, and I spoke to a guy called BJ Fogg, who's this um, famous uh, data scientist at Stanford University, a computer scientist, and he runs a lab called the Captology Lab which means computers as persuasive technology. And he believes it's said on his website that in, we could bring about world peace in 30 years if we could understand how to harness this attention grabbing power of our machines. Um, but again, I think we need to be slightly cautious to assume that that is going to be the case. You know, attention is a big part of learning, but attention is not the whole game. You can absolutely pay attention to something without learning anything at all. And I think that the kind of attention that you need um, when you're learning also requires more engagement and more interaction. More act you need to be active in that process. So if you go into, again, let's go back to King Solomon Academy. King Solomon Academy is a school in London which has done amazing things. So it's been open for about seven or eight years. And in that time, it has become one of the UK's highest performing schools. So there... Um, kids learn more in the five years they're at that school than they do in any other school in the country. So many of them come from um, very disadvantaged backgrounds and then they all end up going to great universities within the UK. And there you see what the power is of capturing kids' attention if you have humans doing that, other kids doing that, um, other people involved in it. Um, and there you're harnessing and holding kids' attention so they're really learning things every day. And that's not using any technology at all, and you get a much better outcome. So this question of motivation is really important. And motivation, yes, some kids have this amazing self-motivation, but um, I think many of them, many of us, you know, humans, we are motivated through connections to other people, whether that's a teacher, whether that's a peer group. And for that reason, I think that although technology can sort of support in that way, maybe it can't, um, it's never gonna replace um, this kind of, human environments and um, the, the real bit I'm excited about I think is in the area of automation so at so there are some dangers of automation so if you or if you outsource too much of your thinking to a machine whether it's your sat nav and you're driving around a place or it's some piece of learning software then you can fail to do the learning that you need to do that lays down the cognitive architecture you're going to want to draw on in the future. And there's an amazing paper I'd point you guys towards with the paradox of the guided user, which lays this out really beautifully, like how your brain does that. Our brains are designed, says the cognitive scientist Daniel Willingham, to avoid thought whenever possible. Um, and so where can automation play a role, I think, in supporting teachers? So in rocket ship schools, which I talked about before, what's happening there is that you're automating part of the teacher's role. So for an hour every day or for 90 minutes every day, that bit in the class where as a teacher, you would just be watching as your kids practice their sums and did their times tables or wrote their essays. At that point, a piece of technology, a sort of semi-smart piece of software can be with the kids, giving them some feedback, adapting some challenges to what they're up to and supporting them in that bit of work. So I think that technology has a real, um, 
role to play there. I think it can save teacher time. Like how could technology help kids do that kind of practicing? It's not going to replace teachers. It will be a tool that they use for some small proportion um, of the class time. So the big thing um, about technology is to think how it sort of augments strong human processes or strong human behaviours or actions rather than um, replaces or, or outsources them. Hmm. I mean, just for this comment here, I think it's like really instructive that you know, many tech um, executives send their kids to schools in which there is no technology or ban their kids from, entirely from using iPads or having smartphones. Um, I do think that that's something which is difficult to deal with at the level of, of, of behaviours. You know, again, speaking to this guy, BJ Fogg, he talks about motivation a lot. Um, and behavior is all about motivation and triggers. So like, do your hot triggers, he calls them, align with your motivations to do things at different times. And that's what smartphones are really, really good at. I like, think they get you motivated and they sort of play on um, your different insecurities. And he actually says that those things are always going to be more attractive in certain moments than wanting to learn something. So I think, you know, we as teachers or peers have to intervene um, in these settings. I think we have to create rules around things like use of smartphones in our classrooms or, or, or at homes. Um, responsible use, there are plenty of schools where you lock your smartphone up where you arrive at the beginning of the day. Um, there are packs that I've seen schools have with parents to limit use of those materials at home. Um, it's difficult for schools to solve that though. I think it's uh, more of a, a, a societal question perhaps. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is a, this is an excellent question. So in South Korea, um, I visited a program called the Future Class Network and Korean education, as I have touched on a little bit, is like very textbook oriented, um, very heavily connected to ideas of rote learning, connected to this exam, the Sunning that people take, which is, which kind of really influences in a, in a bad way how education works in that country. Um, and the students within the system almost have a sort of, uh, this sense that that's the only way things can happen. Like I can only operate in one way. I'm gonna work from the textbook intensively to achieve the grades that I need in, in my exams. But this group called the Future Class Network is introducing um, new sort of flipped classroom practices within Korea and working directly with students to help them have experiences of learning in a different way. And so there I visited these kids in a high school, um, again in Songdo, and interviewed some of them. And they had been using a flipped classroom in which their teacher had continued to give them the work to do from the textbook, but was asking them to do that themselves at home or outside of class. And then within the classrooms was engaging those students in experiential activities and creating their own experiments and going out into the community to carry out, you know, tests on the quality of food, to do, um, you know, surveys of public health. So he was creating this project based approach when he was with the kids, getting them to work together in teams and then getting them to cover the textbook content outside of the classroom. And all of the kids had said, said to me that at first they thought that they risked falling behind working this way. They were terrified they were going to fall behind in this race to the top for the, you know, Sunyung exam. But after a while, like after doing this for a few weeks, for a few months, they had all turned around and realised that actually they were learning more and more deeply in this flipped classroom setting so i think if as a teacher you're able to like really well design those kinds of learning experiences then you can you can create a new classroom approach new classroom culture while still covering the necessary content and i think it's about building that environment building those teams among students building those kind of peer support like kids learn really well 
from each other better than they would do from the textbook, better than they would do from the teacher. Um, that's proven many times over. So what could we do as teachers to kind of flip the way that that learning happens? I think it's worth exploring. Um, thank you all so much for such, such thought provoking questions. Um, as, as we come to the end of our time with Alex, I think um, Neha's question around what could cause a mindset shift in teachers who are currently gripped with the priorities of, of the system um, is, is one that I'd love to hear Alex's thoughts on before we, before we wrap up for today. Can you repeat that question, Aaron? I'll just, I'll repeat it and, and post it again in the, in the bottom of the chat window. It's what could cause a mindset shift in teachers who are currently gripped with the priorities or grading systems? Mm. The system? Yeah, I think that on top of a kid's education revolution, we need a teacher education revolution. Um, I think, first of all, we can tell new stories about what teachers are and, and who they are today. I always think about this idea that you know we're living in a world now in which all of our resources are running out we're running out of space we're running out of energy we're sort of degrading our planet in awful ways um, but there is one unlimited resource that we have and that's the resource of human imagination and ingenuity and human brain power um, and, te and teachers are the cultivators of that last frontier of human potential like what kind of stories can we tell about who teachers are and I think that we could picture a new role for teachers today and tell new stories about it. Imagine if you are a teacher and as a teacher, you are an expert in how to coach a group of kids to find their purpose and fulfill their potential. You're an expert in a subject area that's your passion, that you care deeply about. You're beginning to become an expert in neuroscience and understanding how brains develop and kids' minds work. You're also an able user of the latest pieces of technology which you're using to outsource um, some aspects of learning in your classroom. Like if we could tell a story about that being the role of the teacher in the future, about the person that creates this new future, about the person that knows the latest insights in um, these different areas, could we have teachers thinking differently. Another piece I think that's important is teacher training. Could we imagine a different type of teacher training trajectory in that instance, where you start out as a novice practitioner or an apprentice in a classroom working practically, um, you then become an expert over a number of years and then you specialize in one of those particular areas. Um, but I think we have to be, that starts I think with this idea of movement building. We have to be kind to other teachers. I think we have to get to know teachers. We have to build strong relationships with them. People don't get better at doing their, their work in the classroom by some clever policy pulled at the top of a system or, being, or by being driven towards a set of targets that are imposed from above. They get better, I think, through the changing culture that we could affect within an education system. And I think that all of us um, can play a role in that. All of us have agency in making that the case. Alex, as, as you've shared everything from your insights from, from your world tour and the power of revolutionary systems and seeking new priorities to pushing the sort of limits of the brain and also maximizing our happiness and well-being um, to thinking about building passion and sparking romance for for things that, that students are are, um, are charged by or motivated by. I think what's what's really stood out to me through the range of questions that have that have come across to you and how you've answered them is just your your very resolute and and um, and firm optimism. I think these these questions that all of us are asking of you um, and thinking about are incredibly difficult ones. Um, it's, it's a challenging process to change a system, but I think your, your belief in this prospect um, and seeing instances of this happening around the world is something which, which is giving me a lot of hope and, and hopefully giving hope to many of the other people on this call as well. So just wanted to thank you so much for, for your time and for, for kicking off our webinar series. Um, 
everyone who's been on this call, it's been, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you for, for your contributions and your questions. Um, please keep an eye out for more webinars like this in, in the future. We'll be hosting people from both within and beyond the KER Collective to share their thoughts about a reimagined education, to dialogue about the different experiments that, that people are working on, and, and ultimately what, what we can all do together to reimagine education with our students. So a, a big thank you to all of you. Thank you to everybody else. Yeah, thank you for, for being here. And thank you for the work that you do. I'm incredibly excited that you're all working on this.